Praise God. Today I want to talk a little bit about a multiple of concepts. Concepts like suffering, concepts like dreams, concepts like forgiveness, concepts like suffering for no cause of your own. I don't really like topics so much. I, I could name the sermon, Don't Stop Dreaming. I could, I could name it, Dream Killers, Watch Out. You know, we could, uh, we, we could go on and give different, but you can choose your own topic. But I'm going to talk a little bit about understanding God's purpose in suffering and in hardship. Because sometimes we give up when difficult times come. And we think that God is punishing us or some other witchcraft or some other stuff. But we need to understand God's words. So bow your heads with me and let's open the word of God and let's seek God's answers. Father in heaven, as we open your words, we, we open your words with a kind of enthusiasm, a kind of joy, a kind of excitement, knowing that you always have a word for us. So now, Lord, come now, take our minds and our hearts and make us stand still and know that you are God. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. You turn your Bibles with me to James chapter 1, a kind of book that we love to look at because we have answers. James chapter 1, as in the New Testament, James. And uh, as you come to chapter 1, we look at verse 2 to 4, and we hear God giving us a purpose for suffering. He is elucidating the concept. And verse 2 of James chapter 1. Are you there? Okay, there we are. My brethren. My whom? My brethren. Speaking to the church folks here now. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. What? What did you say? Let's read it again. Count it all joy when you fall into trials and suffering and hard times. Oh my. There's nothing to be joyful about in suffering. There's nothing to be joyful about in hardship and trials and temptations. But the Bible says, uh, James says, be what? Be joyful. Why would I need to be joyful? He says in verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith work at what? Patience. But let patience have a perfect work. That he may be what? Perfect and entire wanting nothing. In other words, James says, when you come into some suffering and some hardship, and some trials. Don't get discouraged. Don't complain and cry and mope. But what you should be doing, you should be happy because God is remaking your character. He's bringing you to a better state of perfection. Wow. My Lord, I hear you. The end result is nice, but I don't like the process. If you could just skip the middle, you know, bring me to the end, I would be okay, you know. I want to be perfect. Yeah, I like that. I want to be, I want to have a good character. I want to be strong. I want to be victorious. But, you know, save me the suffering. We don't like that. And so as soon as a little difficulty comes into our lives, we ask God, please, 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 take it away. Take it away, Lord. Heal me. Take away the problem. Save me. Why? 
back is we don't understand the process of suffering. God uses trials and temptation and suffering to make us pure. That sounds mystical, doesn't it? And that's what the Bible says. But you say, I, okay, I hear you, Pastor. But let, let's, let's examine Paul's statement in this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Are you there? 2 Corinthians chapter what? 12. And Paul here is, is talking about he had a, he knows of a person who went to heaven, went to paradise, and so forth. And he's, 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 he's really reflecting. And then he comes to verse 5. 2 Corinthians 12. I'm taking my time so you can get it. 2 Corinthians 12. And let us pick up from, I mean, it's sometimes good to catch the whole concept, but let's come to verse 7. Uh, let's read from 5 because you might not get the full. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. What? You're glorying in your sickness? In your weakness? You are triumphing like it is something awesome, Paul says, yes. And then in verse in verse 6 he says, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seemed me to be, or that he heareth of me. Verse 7, Unless I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. Hmm. For this thing I sought, uh, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice or uh, three times. That it might depart from me. Now we're getting warm now. James says, rejoice when you got into problems. Paul says, hey, you know, sometimes God gives you a little difficulty and a little hardship, a little suffering because he wants to keep you humble. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Here we come now. He wants to keep you what? Humble. So Paul says, listen. I went to heaven. I went to paradise in a vision. I saw heaven and I heard things that I can't even tell you. It was so awesome. I have received more revelation than anybody else. And so Paul is this mighty apostle who have seen Jesus many times. And he says, God says, you know, with all that knowledge, and with all that privilege and experience, you might get puffed up. Your head might swell. And your shoes might get too big for your foot. So you know what? I love you, Paul. And I want to save you. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you a little irritation. I'm going to put a thorn in your skin. And that thorn is going to irritate you. It's like the oyster with that, with that what? Grain of sand under the shell. And every time the oyster moves, what happened? The grain of sand or whatever it is, the irritant or the parasite, whatever, is irritating. Ugh. And uh, it keeps irritating, but guess what? While the irritation, it is secreting a substance that is forming the pearl. So you see, God says, Paul, I'm going to put that little thorn in your flesh. And every time you're about to get puffed up and big and your head swell, the little thorn would... 
And Paul will get, Paul will say, oh, 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 okay, Lord, okay, Lord, okay, I'm humble, I'm humble. What a God. You need to have a different attitude towards your problems. Because some of us, we are not big like Paul. We ain't privileged like Paul. We haven't had revelations and visions like Paul. We haven't been used like Paul. We haven't been so magnificent in having such closeness with God. And yet, even in our little bit, some of us get so big. We used to have a young lady in our community. She was a Christian girl and uh, she was also educated. And let me tell you something. When she's walking through the street, she's up like this. I mean, she doesn't say hi to anybody. She doesn't look down. She's always, I mean, that's kind of okay to look up, but man, she was really crisping through town. And she wouldn't say a thing to any soul. You know, sometimes God says, hey, I resist the proud, but I give grace to the humble. You see, you don't understand sometimes why you got that problem you have. And sometimes everything is going good in your life. You think you're on the pinnacle of success and you're truly enjoying everything and then bam, something happens and you say, oh, here it comes now. What have I done? And the worst part is God will punish some of us to wake us up and we would never learn the lesson. Paul learned his. Three times he went to the Lord and he said, Lord, please, I'm begging you, please take away this thorn. I don't like this thorn in my flesh. Take it away. Three times he went and finally God says to Paul, what did God say to Paul? And the Lord said unto me, my grace, my what? Grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made what? Perfect in weakness. <laughs> After Paul got that answer, you know, this is in, it is in red in my Bible. It is in red. It means that's the word of the Lord. After he prayed, when you are going through your hardship, you need to pray and God will answer you. He always answers and tells you why you're suffering. But you must be listening and then Paul says, now, Paul says, I got you, Lord. And when he got the message from God, he says, more gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, this got me, this got me, this got me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmity. Oh, my Lord, I take pleasure in suffering. I take pleasure in hardships. I take pleasure in difficulties, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress. For whose sake? For Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. You know, brethren, as a pastor for nearly 40-something years now, for 30 odd, well, 35 years now, you know what I have learned? I have seen saints humbled. Oh, yeah. I have had some saints in the church who became too big. They became too big for their size. And they became so puffed up and so strong that they were crushing everybody around them. I remember in a particular church, this lady, she fears neither man nor God. She tells anybody anything that comes to her mind, whenever it comes to her mind. She fears no one. If you're in a meeting with her and you ever say something that she doesn't like, she's cover you right there and turn you down. 
Even to the pastor, she cares no fool. I'm not saying this because it is a glory. But then one day, I didn't see her in church. And I said, what happened? Following Sabbath, she was not in church again. So we know something is wrong because as much as she give all the trouble, she's always in church. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She's always in church. She gives all the trouble in the world, but she's always in church. And so I decided to go find out. So I went and we looked for her and we discovered. And as soon as I saw her, I knew something was wrong. Because she did not have the regular countenance. You know the countenance? The haughty countenance? She was looking troubled in her face. And we said, what happened? And we sat down. And we start talking. And she says, Pastor, I went to the doctor. And the doctor said, I have cancer. And the cancer is taking over my body. And I have three months to live. I mean, my heart was, was broken. Let me tell you something. You see, for the next three months, if I had one saint in the church, it was that lady. She was the sweetest thing you will ever meet. And I'm asking myself the question, we prayed for her that God would heal her. And she exhibited faith. And she exhibited a change in her personality. I remember even though she had a cancer, the amazing thing is she was not sick like normal. You see, your mind has something to do with it. And anytime anybody said anything nasty or rude, she would reprimand them. Don't do that. She became one of the sweetest, kindest persons I've met in the church. And I'm telling you, up to the day when she was dying, she, was, she had a glow on her face. And she said, don't worry about me. I have made it right with my God. And I will see you in heaven. Now you tell me something. You going to judge God now? You going to judge God, but let me tell you something. She is only just one of the many examples I've seen. Because otherwise, if God does not let some serious trial, and even sometime to the point of death, come to some of us, we would never see his face. I mean, that's kind of strange, Pastor, the way you're putting it. But I'm telling you, sometimes if we are not on our backs, we won't look up. Sometimes if we are not going through hardship, we won't call to God. And God sometimes sees that there's only one way left for me to save that soul. And it's to put you on your bed. God's purpose, here is what I'm telling you. God's purpose for suffering is for salvation. And every suffering, every disease that he allows to come into your life, every difficulty and hardship and every test that comes into your life, God means it for your salvation. Or else he would not allow it to come. By the way, the Bible says the opposite way. God says, if you are not getting any beating, because you're a bastard. In other words, God says, if I'm not spanking you, you're not my child. But all my children, I spank them. I give them the spanking to bring them into line. But if I'm not giving you any trials or any hardship or any tests, it means you don't belong to me. Oh, what, a mighty, what a mighty God we serve. God is truly amazing. I, I love the way he works. And so God says, Paul says, I will glory. I am not going to curse. 
I'm not going to get discouraged and give up when some difficulty comes. I'm going to keep trusting in God. And I'm saying to any one of you here who may be going through trials and you have dreams and somehow those dreams are constantly being thrown down and every time you seem to get closer to your dream, you see another path open up and it keeps going and going and going and you're going up, you're going down and you just can't find the happiness. Life is just so hard. You keep asking, God, why me? Every time it seems like something good is going to happen, boom, something falls apart. And I keep going over and over like this. And every time I seem so near to my goal, my goal and by the time I should get there, boom, it's gone again. I, I, I'm tired, Lord. Well, why, why? What have I done? Have I done any wicked thing? Sometimes we start questioning God. But the, the other side is also true. When you're going through suffering, don't think you're alone. And don't think you're the only one. We have a habit of thinking that, oh, why me, Lord? Why me? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, we have a promise from God that I love dearly because it's so awesome. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, it says to us, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, what? Take heed, lest he fall. There had no temptation, same word for trial, taken you but such as is what? Common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Oh boy. Oh no. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that he may be able to bear it. Wow. Have you ever been tempted? Ridiculous question, Pastor. Have you ever been really tempted? Tempted until you start perspiring heavily. You don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, tempted until you start shaking. And you don't know what temptation is. You don't know what temptation is if you haven't been really tempted. Well, I have been tempted. And I am still being tempted. And every day I'm tempted. I think I'm alone here, all you saints down there. But God says, this is amazing, young people. Young people, think about this. Every temptation you face, God says to you, hey, that's not unique. So don't think it's unique and you're the only one going through that kind of temptation. And God says, listen, with all and every temptation you feel, listen, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond your strength. He will not make the temptation overpower you so that you have no strength to conquer it. I'm going to tailor the temptation right to your ability to handle it. And if you don't have it, I'll give you the strength to deal with it. Oh boy. Mm -mm. So, what about those temptations that we are constantly falling to? And like Eve, you know, we say to God, Well, it's not my, I'm not to be blamed. It is a serpent. See, the serpent is the one who. Ooh, ooh, and beguile me. I was going my own sweet way. I had no intention of, of doing anything wrong. And here comes the serpent. Uh, and he was so smart and he was so good. He's the one who caused me to sin. 
And then when Adam came, God said, Adam, what happened? He said, whoa, Lord, it's not my fault, really. It's the woman that you have given me. She's the one who caused me to sin. See what I'm saying? Anytime you start making excuses and start looking for somebody to blame for your falling in temptation is an indication that you are not truly repentant. Did I hear that? Are you don't understand? Anytime you are tempted, God says you don't have to fail. Because right beside you, I am standing and I have the power ready and available to you. And by the way, the temptation, I done tailor it. I done soften it right to your ability so that you may handle it. So when you come to the club and you're passing the club or you're not even passing the club, your friend come and say, hey, Man, I want us to go to the club tonight. Because you know, a few Adventists love the club, you know? Yeah, man, they go to the clubs and boogie it down. Yeah, they go to the club. So when a person comes to you and says, let's go to the club. And in your head looms the dance floor and the music and the way you can dress. Some folks tell you how they dress for the club, breast out. All this part and different part out, and they go to the clubs and they. Re I'm talking about Adventists, you know. They move it up and dig it up and go back. So when that temptation hit you, and you say, uh, God says, guess what? I softened the temptation so that you would not have to say yes. But you know what some people say? Well, you know, it was so-and-so who invited me. I, I didn't plan to go, but so-and-so invited me. And, and I didn't even want to go in, but they were pulling my hands. <laughs> you know those kind of people? Or you have your boyfriend, and you're already planning your heart that no sex before marriage. <clears throat> and he says to you, come on, sweetheart. Just come in the room with me. Nothing is going to happen. I'm a strong guy. I have self-control. You don't have to worry. Just come on in the room with me. You go in the room with him. And he said, well, you can just lie on the bed beside me. Nothing is going to happen. I'm a guy with self-control. And he said, lie on the bed. And then next thing. He said, well, you can kiss me. I'm not going to lose any control. I'm going to be good. And then boom, from kissing to, you know, and, know, and then boom, next thing, you're in serious trouble. And then you come out and you say, it's his fault. It's his fault. I didn't want to go into the room, but he forced me to go into the room. God says that cannot go in a court. You have your own mind and you have your own will. You need to know your own strength and you need to know what you can handle. And sometimes the sad truth is you don't know. So the best thing to do is not to go so close to temptation without yielding to it. The best thing to do is to stay far from it. See, that's the best thing? Yeah, so I say in my house, if she's not here, right? She's not, she's not here. I don't want to say anything. She's here. She's here, eh? Oh, I, she kind of mash up the business now. Because I wanted to make an analogy. Well, I, I think I can make the analogy anyhow. I would, say, <laughs> I would say, parents, if you have your children and they start courting, are having a, a, fr a special friend and they come to your house and they go into their rooms, tell them the door must be left unclosed. I didn't say unlocked. So don't confuse unlocked with unclosed now. It must not be closed. It must be opened wide enough. 
that just by passing, I can see what's going on. You have some children who come to your house and all of a sudden they come in because they are bosses and they go into their room with their significant other. Close the door. And nobody dare open the door. Not in my house. It is your fault if anything goes wrong in the house. Because God holds you responsible for maintaining the kind of discipline that shuns the appearance of evil. Now you're not saying you don't trust your children. Of course you trust them. But you can't put fire in your bosom. I don't expect to get burned. So the, the principle of the father, I, I follow that principle. I follow that principle myself when I was courting. No closed door. Because I know the power of the human nature. And you don't know, so I forgive you. You, know? you don't know what I'm talking about. But temptation is not something to play games with. And God intends for us to learn. And so the Bible says that when the temptation comes, you should be ready knowing that God is by your side. And he says, I have an escape route for you. You don't know how to get out, but I have an escape route for you. And if you are looking, you will find it. I am not going to stand up here and say to you, I have found the route all the time. There was sometimes I saw the escape route and I say, not today, Lord, tomorrow. But you don't know what I'm talking about. But there were many times I got God's escape route and it was awesome. Awesome. Some of them, I didn't even believe I did it. I said, oh my God, you did it? Wow, that's awesome. But brethren, young people, let me tell you something. Don't Make excuses. Don't blame. Take responsibility for your own life. Whenever you are facing a temptation, remember your relationship with God and trust God. He promised you that he will always be with you and he will deliver you and God is faithful. So the Bible says, God is faithful. You can trust him when he says he will deliver you. But you must not put yourself on the devil's ground. You know, it's kind of strange that sometimes some people have a weakness for alcohol. Weakness for alcohol. But guess where they find themselves? In the bar or in the club. I mean, come on, you, 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 you're weak with alcohol, and yet you find yourself in the club and in the bar, sitting down on the bar table with people around you drinking. Isn't that stupid? That's kind of stupid because you have a weakness, and that weakness is driving you. You should try to what? Stay what? Far from it. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, that's right, son, son. He said, far. And that's what I want to tell you, young people. Some people believe that it, how close you can get to temptation without sinning. That's not what the Bible says. How far you can stay from it. But you know, the trials that God brings into your life, here, here is this one. Ellen White says this too. She backs up that thing. She says, every temptation you face and you fail, you become weaker for the next one. Oh my goodness. Every temptation you face and you fail, you become weaker for the next one. But she flipped the coin and she says, every temptation you conquer and overcome, you become stronger for the next one. Wow. So here is the danger. Here is the danger. Listen to me. Oh, God be merciful. 
Here is the danger. The more God reveals to you and the more knowledge you have of God's will is the more dangerous it is for you to yield to temptation. Why, pastor? Listen. Every time you deliberately yield to temptation, you weaken your will. And your will becomes so weak that it becomes enslaved. That is what we call something like addiction. And you find you can't resist it anymore. No matter how you try, you're going to do it. And that's what happened to a lot of people. For their life. They are slaves. They have told lies so much that today they lie naturally. There are a lot of Adventists who can bear witness with me that lying has become a habit and a lifestyle. You know why? Because every time we tell the one little white lie and the one little pink lie and the one little yellow lie, we end up telling a big black lie and then after a while we find out that by our characters we are just liars. And we seldom tell the truth. Some people even when you find their hands on the gun, they say, I, I'm, 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 I, I was just, you know, trying to feel it to see what it feels like. But every time we yield and fail, we become weaker and weaker. And that's why today the church is so weak. Because if we are honest, there are a lot of us who are habitual sinners. Habitual sinners. We don't even fight temptation anymore. And by the way, we choose the ones we want to fight. Some of them, we must love for them. And we fight them. But there are others we say, <laughs> come to me. Yeah, we don't fight those temptations. Because you see, what we have done is, because James said, oh, when we are tempted, we are drawn away of our own lust and desires. You see, the problem is, temptation becomes powerful when it harmonizes with our desires. And we have some desires and some emotions that we long to gratify. The desire for food. The desire for belonging. The desire for affection and love. That's why some people are so vulnerable because of the desire for affection. The slightest little person come by and touch you and say a nice little word. You just uh, gone. Because you're so hungry for attention. You're so hungry for affection. And sometimes parents, watch out now. Don't condemn them. Because sometimes it is our lack. Here is a child coming to a mother. Mama, hug me. Mama say, I'm not the huggy type. I mean. You're not the huggy type. Your children need to be hugged. Come on, brethren, you should. Uh, what am I talking here? You need to hug them. And you need to say nice things to them. Alicia has a dozen or much terminologies. If she falls for a guy, it cannot be for lack of affection and love. Because she knows the first guy that comes along and says, Oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, man, heaven must be missing an angel. You know those kind of, those kind of statements? Yeah. 
They're telling you all the, yeah, of course, he hear Shaggy sing the songs. Come on, you hear this stuff. But listen to me, you know what I'm talking about. And the, sometimes you're so starved. Because you see, the desire inside of us is what makes them station so strong. We must be compassionate and understanding. That some people are more vulnerable than others. And that's why you must be a brother's keeper. And tell your friend the truth. Don't go with him. Don't go. You hear what I say? Don't go. Tell them the truth. Because you know they are weak. And so... Even though the church is supposed to be a loving community. The church is supposed to be a loving community. This is the place where you should feel safe coming and get a hug. Come on, you didn't hear me. This is the place where you should feel safe to come and get a hug. Okay, you're not even understanding me. The Bible says you should greet one another with a holy kiss, right? Now... Which is most intimate, a hug or a kiss? <laughs> a holy kiss, I said. Did I say a holy kiss? The kiss must be pure. Come on, the kiss must not be ulterior motive. The kiss must not be, mm -hmm, I've been waiting for this moment. That's not what the kiss means. A holy kiss means you are my brother and my sister in Christ. And I want you to know that I love you. And the same thing with a hug. It must not be. It must be. And let go. You know it must not be. You know what I'm talking about? You, you, you must make that hug reflective of something that is what? Pure. However, however, friendships are not all equal. Oh, no, pastor. Watch what you're doing now. You might get into trouble and you can't come back. Friendships are not all that equal. For example, let's say this is br brother or sister, um, Brown and great whatever and we have grown up together and we know each other and we've been friends all the time and we meet that hug could be far different than the hug of a stranger you see what I mean so no don't because you see the hug lasts for a few seconds you say mm-hmm you, you, you get what the point I'm saying in other words don't be quick to judge the truth of the matter is there are individuals who are lonely. And sometimes they lack affection. But you know, that's why the devil takes advantage of us. He knows our weakness. And he knows that this is a church. This is where you come. And this is where you're supposed to find that kind of clean fellowship and support. So that when this sister and this brother comes in and they get a hug, sometime, somehow, that's all the physical connection they get for the entire week. They get it here. So it must be wholesome and clean. Come on, Pastor, why did you need to say that? West Mount don't need to hear that. And so God, in his infinite mercy, allows us to come into these situations in life because he's teaching us how to be strong. And so every time you come into a temptation, watch your desires. Take careful note of them. And know, woman, know thyself. Man, know thyself. In other words, you must study your strengths and your weaknesses. And you must know what you can handle. Start learning what you can handle. And if you can't handle it, don't get boastful and put yourself into a position that you can't handle yourself. So the Bible wants us to know that in temptation that is meant to, be, to bring deliverance to us. He's saying to you, when you get into them, just remember I am there. And I'm there to help you. 
So when you know your weakness, you must be more alert. And don't show yourself too vulnerable. I bring this sermon to the passage that I would like to close it with. And I want to turn you way back into the Old Testament to a young man that I think we need to emulate a lot. This young man is a typical example of what it means to be victorious. Genesis 45. Genesis chapter 45. We have the patriarchs here and we have a young man by the name of Joseph. You see, you have to understand something about Joseph before we bring it to this point. Remember now, Joseph was a dreamer. <laughs> and, and, and Joseph had some dreams that made him look like he was going to be great. And his friends, his brothers, envied and coveted him. And from envy, it moved into hate and hostility. And next thing, Dave, Joseph was sold into slavery. I don't understand how God works. Because he just revealed to Joseph, Joseph, I'm going to give you a dream. And he said, look here, the sun and the moon and the stars bow down to you. Wow. That means I'm going to be great. And the greatest of the greats will bow down to me. The sun is the principal bodies up there in our solar system. And all of these systems bow to Joseph. Joseph, you're going to be great. And when he told his dreams, his brother realized that he was going to be great. And instead of saying, brother, congratulations. I have your back. And when you get into your kingdom, remember me. They hated him and sold him into slavery. But God, I thought I was going to be great. But here am I in slavery in a foreign land. <laughs> and Potiphar bought Joseph. Joseph went to his house. And this is where you can't keep a good person down. <laughs> you can't keep a good person down. De Joseph is now sold into slavery. And here he is in Potiphar's house. And he's so successful. Potiphar said, my, 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 my. This boy has talents. This guy has gifts. This is not a slave. You know what, buddy? I trust you so much. You have my whole house. Everything in my house is under your control. And I am the only person higher than you in this house. There was there's only one thing that is not in your charge. And that's my wife. And Joseph said, you don't need to tell me that. Joseph in his heart said, you don't need to tell me that. Not because I'm in slavery. Not because I'm down here in Egypt. You think I don't have character? You think I am not God blessed and God gifted? You see brethren, where you are should not be the total summation of who you are. You might be a domestic worker, but that doesn't mean you don't have character. And that shouldn't mean you are not God's child. You see, you should not make where you are and what you do define how people treat you. It doesn't matter where you work and what you do for work. You should be dignified in what you do. Even if you are sweeping the street, you sleep, you sweep the street with dignity. Come on now. Oh yeah, you still hold your head up high. I, I like the way they work here in this country. I see these guys sweeping in, in the mall and they have on ties. Wow. They have on ties, man. And they're sweeping and mopping. But you look at them, they look dignified. I said, wow. That's how we should be. We should be dignified. 
And David and, and Joseph is saying, hey, king, hey, party for that's, that's all right. I got you. And then came his test. Man, just when I start looking up, man, I thought I'm on my way to my dream now. Oh God, it got bad. I got beaten up by my brother, thrown in a pit, sold into slavery. And here am I being bought. I thought it was going to be wicked and cruel. And here am I progressing. I am now the second man in the house. I am big. And it looked like I'm going to arrive. And then boom, here comes this woman. Just when I thought I'm going into my dreams. And Joseph said, Come on now, lady. I might be a slave in your house, but I'm not a slave in my heart. See, you get to know that. And I say to people who do domestic work and work for these, for these big shots, don't let them use you. Because some of these bosses think that because you're working with them, you are their property. And because they hand you a check at the end of the week or at the end of the month, they believe they can do anything with you. But you must hold your dignity. You must say, I'm working with you and I earn my wages. And don't be licky licky. Licky licky. Don't be licky, licky. Uh, well, the Bible says, be content with your wages. You know, I, 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 I lift my hat to those young ladies who work with some of these uh, big guns who like to come and flash their wealth before them and then invite them in, you know, into, into situations. And these young ladies who can say, I'm sorry. What, what do you want? They're always coming to you. What do you want? What do you want me to buy you? What do you want me to get you? Say thank you very much. Because nothing is free. Did you hear me? Nothing is free. It's a form of grooming. Yeah, so you take one gift, you take two gifts, you take three gifts, you take four gifts, and then he says, okay, it's time for me to get a gift too. <laughs> yeah, that's how it comes. He get gift one, gift two, you get gift three, gift four. It's now time for him to get his gift. You see, just remember, I say to you young people, nothing is free. So learn to stay within your own salary and don't sell yourselves. Joseph said, the woman manipulated Joseph's head and said, Joseph, come on now, Joseph. You're the biggest thing in the house. Come on. And I am the queen of the house. Now, if you play my card, I will play your card and you will be fine. All you have to do, Joseph, is you give to me and I give to you. You make me happy and I make you happy. You see, especially if you make me happy, Joseph. Let me tell you, Joseph, you, nobody can touch you, Joseph. I mean, it was tempting. And Joseph said, Now look here, lady. I serve a God. And I am on my way to fulfillment of a dream. You think I'm going to squander that dream right now? No, I cannot sin against my God. And Joseph paid the price. Prison. Oh. Just when I thought I got it, and this is the worst case, now I'm in prison for r practical rape. 
And who did I want to rape? Oh my God, this is funny. But guess what again? Joseph got into prison. And guess what happened? The prison guard says, I like this guy. There is something about him that I like. You know what, Joseph? You're in prison, but the prison is yours. Do whatever you want. I am the only one higher than you. You cannot keep a good man down. So even in prison, he's still thriving. Finally, he told, he interpreted dreams. And next thing, Joseph was next to the king. But that's not what I want to leave with you. What I want to leave with you is this. Joseph is about to interpret the reason for all that journey. Jealousy, beaten up, thrown in a pit, sold in slavery, harassed by a woman, thrown in jail, coming out of jail, ascending to the throne. Oh God, why did you take all that route? To get me here. And that's the amazing thing about suffering and trials. God is on his way to elevating you. You just need to stay the course. Joseph stayed the course. He stayed the course. And now he reaped the reward. And then here comes the 12, the 11 brothers. Ha ha. Where are they heading? Down to Egypt. Hungry killing them. And they're going down there for food. Boom, they arrive in Egypt. Lo and behold, who is there to give them food? Nobody but the stone that the builder rejected is now the head cornerstone. Here comes Joseph. Got the vision, Lord. Uh, you took me all that long to bring me here, but oh Lord, what a God. And now look at them. They don't even know it's me. And let me tell you, man, Joseph, rub it in. Joseph said, I want to see if they have changed. I wonder if you're getting a message there. Before forgiveness, oh, you're looking for change. These mean mongrels, rascals who treated me all that bad. Now is my time to get them in my grip and grab them by the neck and just, you know how long I've been waiting for this? You wicked little wrong mother. You know what you did to me? And now here you are in my hands. And God has delivered you into my hands. Now I am the most mighty man in the land. I can do anything I want to do with you. And I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'm going to crack your neck one by one. You know, that was how Joseph could have responded. I could sit down now, eh? Brethren, when you're on your way to glory, when you're on the way to the fulfillment of your dreams, anything God took from you, you don't need it. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. I said anything God takes from you, you don't need it. As precious as it might look to you and you feel you can't live without it, if God takes it, let it go. Because you should be on your way to the fulfillment of your dreams. Come on, I wish I could preach this. Therefore, Joseph said to the brothers, finally, he couldn't take it anymore. After testing them, he said to them, I like it. I like how Joseph did it. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried. 
Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him. While Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard him crying. And Joseph said to his brothers. I love it. I am Joseph. <gasps> I mean I could imagine Oh, Lord. You know, like when you're going to get beating for your parents? And you finally discover your parents found out? <laughs> you, start to say, Ooh, you, you really start to rub out the place where you don't get any hit yet. Yeah, this is it now. It's like, oh, my God. We're finished now. I am Joseph. And they are looking for fire and brimstone and hell to pour down on their souls. And Joseph said, Doth my father yet live? Oh, wait a minute. It doesn't seem like he's going to kill us yet. And his brethren could not answer him. Of course you couldn't talk. By then you'll be saying, You couldn't talk. They couldn't talk. They were so dumb and, and trembling with fear because it's retribution time. And they were saying, and, said, and his brethren could not Answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said to his brethren, Come near. Wow. To your enemies, you should say, Come near. Come near to me, I pray. And they came near to him, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother. Wow. You mean we are still your brother? Whom? <coughs> you so so sold into slavery into Egypt. Wow, please don't tell us, Joseph, we know that we did that. Now therefore, be not grieved. Huh? Be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves. Wow, where are you getting with this now? That he sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Come on now, Joseph. Why are you twisting the story like that? They, those boys want you dead. But God, in his infinite wisdom, saw what was going to happen. And say, I'm going to use this moment. <laughs> I'm going to use this moment to bring about their salvation. Oh no, tell me, what a God is this? Why they're doing evil and why they're doing wickedness? God is using even the very wickedness to bring them salvation. Tell me if you can beat God. Even in our wicked, foolish behavior, God is going to use it to even save us. God said, that, that, that's what it is. For these two years... Had the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall be neither, there shall neither be airing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a prosperity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And Joseph forgave his brothers. Why could Joseph forgive his brothers? I'm going to say something. And if you miss anything else I said in the sermon, you must not miss this. Why did Joseph forgive his brothers? You know why? He now understood God's purpose in his life. He now understood why God took him through this journey. And now he's become a deliverer. You see, that is it. Listen to me now. If you cannot forgive your enemies, it is because you have not learned God's purpose for your life. 
if you understand God's leading you in your life and God's leadership in your life, you know when he brings you to a place where he says now is the time for healing. Because even though you cannot work the math out and know why you had to come this route, why you have to come this way, I, your God, I will show you at the ultimate what is my purpose for your life. And it's now time to forgive. I'm telling you, if Joseph did not understand that, those boys would have been in serious trouble. They would have to spend at least 12 years in prison before he let them out. Here is a, here is a, 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 a little nut. I, I finish. I, I let me not frighten you. Think, pass him. Don't go on anymore, please. But listen to this. Listen to this, though. I'm making an appeal. Sometimes it is hard to forgive, especially when you don't understand why. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's hard. To forgive when you don't understand why. But if you stay close to God. And if you maintain your character. And if you follow your dreams. And the path that God has mapped out for you. When you arrive at that place like Joseph. You will know. Time to forgive that husband. Come on, brethren, I'm not playing games. This is serious business. Time to forgive that wife. Time to forgive that son and that daughter. Time to forgive that boss. Time to forgive that sister. Time to forgive that brethren in the church. There are times when God brings you face to face with the time to throw the axe away. And I'm telling you, until you come to that place, suffering will be a burden and a pain. But I am so awesomely happy that my God cannot be defeated. God cannot be defeated with evil because he turns an evil situation into good. And that's why you can say every time somebody hurts you, don't cut their necks. You know why? If God allow them to hurt you, God has a plan. Come on, no, you didn't get that. Come on, no, you didn't get that. <laughs> if God allows them to hurt you, it's because he has a plan. And if he does not have a plan, he will not allow them to hurt you. If you are his child, he will not allow you to suffer unnecessarily. But if he allow you to suffer, it means he has a plan. And knowing that every trial is bringing you into perfection. Walk into God's perfection. Walk into the fulfillment of your dreams. And pass over those hurdles. And you will arrive in your destination. Let no one kill your dream. Let no one stop you from attaining your goals. Christ's likeness is the highest to be reached. And this is our song of response to God. And we're letting him know that we are not going to give up. Come on now. Let's sing this song.
verse one more time. He's more than able. As I pray to close, brethren, this is your opportunity. A sermon preached without some response is just a stimulation of your intellect and of your emotions. Every message is meant for a decision. And God is bringing that into your life right now. And he's saying, I have a plan for your life. And I'm on my way to fulfilling that plan. Cooperate with me. And to every milestone I bring you, and I elicit a response from you, give that response. And in your journey, this may be the moment for forgiveness. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I know you're not telling us that you have pleasure in seeing us suffering. I know you're not telling us that when we are hurt, we should not respond and say we are feeling pain because the pain is real and the hurt is real and the suffering is real. But you have a plan for it is in the suffering, it's in the hardship, it's in the trials that we reach out to you and take your hand and I'm saying right now, Jesus, I want your help. I want your strength. I want to reach my dreams. I want to reach my full potential. I want that character. I want that victory. I want to be an overcomer. Give me the strength to forgive and to forget and to let go so that the healing might come. Those who are going through difficult times, oh Jesus, be with them. Be beside them. Be over them. Comfort them. And remind them that this too will pass. Yes. And the reward will be joy in the morning. Bless this church and be with those who are going through hard times and help them to arrive at the desired goal you have for them. And may there be victory and deliverance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.